John chapter 4, verse 15 through verse 26. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, and in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So today what we're going to be looking at is the heart of worship and looking at the passage that Pastor Callisto just read for us um, a few minutes ago. And so we're looking at what is the core, what is at the heart of worship? What does Jesus say is at the heart of worship? And we saw in the passage that Jesus says that at the heart of worship, what God is looking for is for worshipers who will worship in spirit and in, in spirit and in truth. And so that's what I'm going to look at today, just looking at what did he actually mean by calling us and saying, we need to be worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. But just before I get into that, I'll quickly just give you a working definition of worship. And we've been doing worship um, the last few Sundays, but I just wanted to mention it so that we're all on the same page as we continue into then what is worshiping in spirit and in truth. So... In terms of what is worship, it is having a heart of reverence, an attitude of reverence towards the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, revering God in everything that we do. When we go about our work, when we go about our studies, in how we relate with our spouses, with our family members, with our children, how we drive on the roads can also be part of worship. In fact, it should be part of worship. Yeah. Um, so worship is about everything, every aspect of our lives. And it's not just when we come and gather together on a Sunday and sing songs or pray or hear the message, but worship should involve everything, that we have a heart of reverence towards the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, an acknowledgement of who he is in everything that we do. And so when we come now into the passage that Pastor Kalista read for us, in John 4, we see Jesus having a conversation with a Samaritan woman at the well. And in that conversation, in the, the 19th verse of that chapter, she asks Jesus a question. And she says in verse 19, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So in other words, she was asking Jesus, so Jesus, where exactly is the right location? Where is it that we should be worshiping? What is the right way? Is it the Jewish way or is it the Samaritan way? And so we see from her question, she was focusing on the external aspects, the external actions and things associated with worship. Where? What is the location? Tell me specifically, which is the right way? Who is right? And we see that if this woman was in this 
century, the 21st century, she probably would have said, Jesus, should we be shouting when we worship? Or should we be clapping our hands? Or should we be silent in quiet contemplation? Should we give 10% of our tithes? Or is it tax, before tax, after tax? So focusing on all the external expressions. What is the right way? That's what she was asking Jesus. Who is right? Is it the Baptists? Is it the Pentecostals? Is it the Anglicans? Who has it right? Who, Lord? And we see in Jesus' response that he takes a completely different angle. And he says to her, worship is not primarily about the mountain or Jerusalem. It's not about the external things, the actions or the rituals or the locations that we worship in. And he says, Jesus declared in verse 21, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So Jesus was saying to her, it's not about those external things. And it's not that those external things are bad. But at the heart and the core of worship is that first and foremost, we must worship. If we call ourselves worshipers, we need to worship in spirit. And so it's about our spirits connecting with God's spirit. Our spirits communing with God as we come into worship. And when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes, as many of us know. He comes and he lives in us and he awakens our spirit. And he gives us the capacity to be able to connect with God, to commune with God in ways that we had never communed with him before. And so the Lord in these passages is actually telling us and he's inviting us, come, encounter me. Let your spirit connect with me. This is what I desire. I want you to connect with me. Come. And so worshiping in spirit is about our internal not necessarily our external, but that our external becomes an expression of our internal. And so if we are saying, God, we are here for you. God, we love you. God, we acknowledge that you are God. Then we must be able then to lift our hands in acknowledgement of who he is or to lie down or whatever the, we feel is an expression of what is actually happening within us. Because it begins with an inner awareness and meditation of the heart, of our heart on who God is. Of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we just say, Lord, we are here to commune with you. And Jesus highlights this again in Matthew chapter 15 verse 8. And here in this chapter, he's speaking about the Pharisees. And what he says of them is, he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are very far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. In other words, Jesus was saying, yeah, these guys, they do all the right things. They say all the right things. Maybe they even stand in the street corner and, you know, lead the prayers. But their hearts are very far from me. So all they are doing is giving me lip service. This their worship is in vain. It is not actually worship, but it's just rules that they are following. And when I was thinking about this, I realized that even for myself, we often treat God in the same way. Like the Pharisees, we declare with our lips, hey, where, where, but our hearts are very far from him. And so God even has been challenging me continuously, saying, where is your heart? Are you communing with me? Are your eyes fixed on me? Is your heart fixed on me? And as I was preparing for this um, teaching, I saw this picture of a child. I just had a, a picture of this child who is waiting so excited for his father to come home. And the child is in the house and they've been, you know, maybe it's holidays. They've been there the whole day and they're waiting. Hey, daddy's coming home. I remember when we were growing up, we would shout, Baba, 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 when he was driving into the house. And so I saw this 
picture of this little child in the house and he's just waiting for his parent to come. And when the parent comes and opens the door, he kind of like acknowledges the child but quickly moves on with the rest of his life. And the child had been so excited, yet there's just a sadness and a disappointment that fills that child when they realize, hey, my excitement, okay, let me just continue playing with my car toys here. And I felt God saying to me, this is the same way he feels when we come. He's excited. He's like, I want to meet with you. Like this little boy is so excited to meet his father. He says, I want to meet with you. I desire to connect with you, to spend time with you. And when he comes and we're like, oh, okay, yeah, God, we acknowledge you. Okay, continue with the rest of my life. Or perhaps we may even be there going through the motions, yet not connecting with him. And so I said, Lord, help us, help us. Help us, Lord, by faith to believe that you are here. As we go about our day, as we do our work, as for those who are studying, for those in their marital relationships, help us, Lord. Help us know what is on your heart. As we speak to our spouse, as we deal with our children, teach us, show us. Help us to commune with you in everything that we do. And as we worship in spirit, it's not a one-way direction. It's, on, it's not only us who are trying to connect with God, but God literally desires to pour out, pour out, pour out, pour out into our lives, to pour out direction, to pour out refreshing, to pour out wisdom, to pour out conviction and rebuke when it's necessary, discipline sometimes, to pour out strategies, ideas, visions, and that's why he says the church is the hope of the world. Because he knows when I pour out into your life, you will change things. You will impact your family. You will impact your children. You will impact your neighbors, whatever sphere that he has placed you in. And when I was thinking about this, I just remembered how one Sunday back in Cape Town, we were just in the midst of worship and a friend of mine who was also one of the worship leaders, she walked in on crutches. She's called Rory Sang. And she had gotten injured during the week. I can't remember if she had torn a ligament or something, but she'd been unable to walk for a while. And she came into the service and she just sat in the congregation during worship, during musical worship. And as, as the, the team was singing, she just began to sing and say, God, I am here for you. And the next thing we knew, the crutches came off. And she was running up and down the stairs because the congregation, the, the building is structured kind of like the balcony. And she began to run up and down the stairs, fully healed. And she had come in not being able to walk. I've seen people get up from wheelchairs as people come and just say, hey, Lord, we are here to commune with you. The other Thursday, a few weeks ago, we were here for the Thursday prayer service. If you haven't yet been there, please, I encourage you strongly. Let us come and seek the Lord. God is doing amazing things. I can see the heads nodding of the people who've been there. Come, let us pray together. And during the Thursday service, as we were in the middle of song, and just prayer, literally God just, his presence came in a way that we haven't experienced at Nairobi Baptist Church in a very long time. And Pastor Calisto tried to preach three times, he tried. Three. He came the first time, hey, okay, he can't. Second time, hey, third time, he said, fine, God, you just do what you want to do. Because the Holy Spirit was pouring out in a way that we hadn't seen before. And we just say, God, we are here. <laughs> we are here to commune with you. So the Lord has things that he desires to pour out in our lives. But it's only when we understand and we begin to worship him in spirit. And we commune with him every single day. Saying, Lord, help me to know you better. 
And sometimes we will feel God's tangible presence as we worship, and other times we will not. And that's the truth. Sometimes we feel like God is very distant, very distant, he's very far. But that doesn't change the fact that he's near. And so this is by faith. We come by faith and we say, God, we choose to believe. Even when we can't feel you, we choose to believe that you are here. And we choose by faith to lay our lives on your altar. And the second aspect that Jesus mentioned to the Samaritan woman is that true worshipers worship in truth. And there are three aspects of truth that I just wanted us to look at today. The first is the truth of who God is. The second is the truth of how we are really doing in our lives. And the third will be the truth of who we are in Christ. And when we look at, again, John chapter 4, in verse 22, Jesus says to the woman, You Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. And so in other words, you're saying, these, the, we don't worship some unknown higher entity, some higher force somewhere. We worship someone that we know. This is a God that we know. And we also need to know this God that we worship. So that we're not just worshiping some, some idea that has been passed on from generation to generation or some idea that Pastor Callisto has come and taught us about on Sunday or Pastor Pinto or Pastor Mulandi, whichever pastor. But this is a God that we know for ourselves. The truth of who God is. Not who we want him to be. Not who the world may say he is, but who does he say he is? And we'll see in scripture often Jesus would go and say, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? He didn't say, who have you heard me to be? Who do you say I am? And God asks us the same question because he wants us to know him. He wants us to worship in the truth of the knowledge of who he is as God in the fullness And yes, it is true that our minds are small. And so as humans, we may not be able to fully grasp the totality of God in the fullness of who he is. But he still invites us as far as we can in our human bodies and where we are right now on earth to know him as much as we can. That's the invitation that God is calling us into. And he says, I don't just want you to know about me. I want you to know me. And we see this in Jesus when just before he's arrested, um, before he's just taken in. And in John 17, he says, um, uh, verse 1 to 3, it says, after Jesus said this, and he had been speaking uh, to the disciples, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all the people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, this is eternal life that they would know you. Eternal life is not about, yeah, I made it into heaven. Woo! I got in. Oh yeah, eternal life, I'm going to live forever. Jesus here says eternal life is that we would know God. And so eternal life begins when we are here on earth. We begin walking this journey and saying, God, we are here to know you. To know you in the fullness that you have desired to release to us. And the truth of who God is is so important for our worship because it influences the depth of our worship. We can only worship to the level of our revelation and understanding of who God is. If we've known God for a few years and knew him 40 years ago and we use that the whole time and never continue to grow and saying, God, teach me more, teach me more, teach me more, our worship begins to stagnate and it begins to just remain in the same place. And we can end up worshiping God out of, okay, it's the routine. Okay, we go to church. Okay, you know, we pray in the house. But 
we're not actually worshiping God the way Job last week we had when he said, I had heard of you, but now I see you and I repent in dust and ashes. He had walked with God for years, yet suddenly he got a new revelation, a new understanding. This is who God is. He's beyond my wildest imagination. And so God is encouraging us. He's saying, come, let me teach you. As worshipers, we need to hunger and thirst for the presence of God, to get into his word, not rely on the Sunday services, ourselves in our private spaces, in our houses, in our families. Let's not rely on yesterday's revelation. Let's not rely everything on the revelation we got 30 years ago because God continuously wants to teach us to show us this is who I am. And the Holy Spirit wants to open our eyes to see who God really is. And I remember as a child growing up, I used to have many nightmares, you know, many, I would, I would even be afraid of falling asleep and fear would fill my heart. And this went on for many years. There are many, many, many nights I called out, Mama! in the middle of the night because of these nightmares that I would have. And the nightmares continued even up to maybe I was in my early 20s and I continued having these nightmares. But I remember when I was in my second year at university, at the University of Cape Town, um, we went to a Bible school and they encouraged us to begin reading. I had always read, I'd been doing devotion, but they was like, get, study the word. You know, and I began to read through the Bible and just take time to study the word. And I had known in my mind that God is all powerful, that God is mighty, but it had never really sunk into my heart. And so as I studied this word and started going through the scriptures, I was like, wow, this God, this God, he's all powerful. He's the commander in chief of the armies of heaven. He releases his angels to walk with us. He says he will never leave us nor forsake us. And so these truths started moving from my head to my heart. And so when the enemy came knocking again in the night, nightmares, suddenly I was still afraid shaking in the bed, you know, but it was still, Lord, I know you are my father. I know that you are here. I know that you will fight for me. I know that you are almighty and the truths began to sink into my heart. And suddenly, after a few, I think, months, the nightmares just stopped. They never came back. And I may have a nightmare every so often, but it's not the way it was. The way fear comes. And even if the enemy comes knocking now, I'm like, hey, please, do you know who my father is? Let's have a conversation. Do you know who my father is? And so, I encourage us, and God is calling us. He says, come, come into the truth of who I am. And the second aspect, the truth of how we are doing. And we see that in his conversation with the Samaritan woman, Jesus gently but very deliberately drew her into discussing how she really was in her life, what was really going on in her life. In verse 16, as we heard earlier, he actually asks her to go and call her husband. And she says, I have no husband, she replied. You are right. And then Jesus said, yeah, in fact, it is true. You have no husband. In fact, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. And so when I read this passage, I asked myself, so then why did Jesus ask her if you already knew? Isn't that a bit redundant? He was asking her, but he knew. So in fact, he's like, yeah, I, yeah, I knew. I just thought I should ask you go, to tell you to go and call your husband. And so we see here, Jesus was actually giving her a choice in that moment. He's telling her, you can either bring me into the truth of your life, or you can choose to lie. Because the woman could have said, yeah, let me go call my husband, and then gone and never come back, ever. 
and then she would have missed out on everything that God did after that in the rest of the chapter. Or maybe she could have even gone home to bring the man she was living with and said, here is my husband. Yeah. And so in that moment, Jesus was actually giving her a choice. But he was also giving her an opportunity, saying, come, step into the truth of how you really are doing in your life. Jesus doesn't want us to come to him covering up shame, covering up sin. He wants honesty and openness because he knows it is only then we can receive what he has for us. God already knows what is going on in our lives. It's not like he doesn't know, just like Jesus knew with this woman. He knows what our struggles are. He knows the things that we battle. Yet he says, come, let's just remove those masks. Remove them, remove them. Just be real with me. Sit here, tell me what is going on with you. And he encourages us to do that. And in the Christian community, hey, we've got masks. Masks, how are you blessed and highly favored? Glory to God. Yet our lives are crumbling on the inside. And we are struggling. And so the Lord is saying to us, Lay down your masks. Lay them down. And he doesn't only want to be let into the truth of the difficulties, of the things that we may be struggling with. God wants to be let into the truth of our whole lives. The joys, the mountaintops. God, you know what happened today? Lord, this breakthrough. He wants to know. He wants to know those details. And David is such a good example of this. When he was on the mountaintop, he would be like, my God, with my God, I can scale a wall. My God is magnificent. My God, and he would have, but also when he was in the pits, he would be like, oh, my father, where have you forsaken me? And when we look at David, and I was reading this one day, I was like, hey, Lord, sometimes David looks like he has multiple personality disorder because one moment he's like, yeah, the next he's like, you've forgotten me. Lord, you are great. You've forgotten. And I was just like, but that's, that's me. That's us. And yet God still says of David, this is a man after my heart. This is a man who is willing to let me in to his heart and that I can receive into my heart. A man after my heart. And if we don't pour out our hearts before God, our hearts slowly become cold and hardened and cynical. And this has happened to me many times until the Lord comes to rebuke me. If we don't let him into that space, we can end up carrying things and piling things um, until we are just so distant and far from the Lord. Many things can make our hearts cold. Disappointment, grief, disillusionment. Time away from the Lord. And I remember the last few years, about two years, we've had many deaths in our families, in our family. Um, and one of the times I had been praying and fasting and saying, Lord, come on, heal. We ask for healing and praying. And then the person I was praying for, they died. And I was just like, eh, hey, Father, here, you've played me. Umeni Cheza. Yani? I've been praying, we've prayed, we've cried out, we've done all these things, and they still died. What is the point then of praying? And I remember just saying, God, I don't even want to talk to you. I don't even want to speak to you. And for weeks, I was just silent. And then one day I was like, Aki, but I still can't live without God. And so I found myself sitting at his feet. And I said, God, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say but I'm here. And in that moment, I remember God speaking to me and clearly saying, without me, even death loses meaning. So even what you see now and you think, oh, it has purpose and it has meaning. And so within me, even death has meaning. And I knew that, but there's a way that he spoke it in that instance. I w was wailing on my knees. Say, God, I don't want anyone else's death not to have meaning. And suddenly, God was breaking the shell around my heart as I let him into the truth of how I was really doing. And so the Lord desires any parts in us that are dead to come to life, to breathe new life into us, to give us a heart of flesh and not a heart of stone. And the final truth 
that I'll just mention because this truth is, is also another one that is so big that really you can do series upon series and not finish it. It's the truth of who we are in Christ. The third truth. The Bible paints a clear picture of who we are in Christ. In the Bible, we see that we are referred to when we know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that we are referred to as sons and daughters, as co-heirs with Christ, that we are loved, that we are redeemed, that we are forgiven, that we are priests that have the capacity to carry the presence of God into every sphere that we step in, that we have been granted authority through Christ, that we are not equal to God, but we are undeserving recipients of grace. So many things that the Lord speaks about who we are, who we are, who we are. He says, understand who I have made you to be. Who have I called you to be? And again, we need to get into the word and begin to allow the Lord to teach us these things. Because too many times we lean on our own understanding. But God, me, I don't think I have authority, but I say you have authority. But God, but God, but God. And we need to lean on God's understanding of who he says we are. Because if we don't believe who God says we are, it hinders our worship. It hinders our worship. If we don't believe that we are really forgiven, if we don't believe that we are sons and daughters who are accepted, we will we'll never want to come deep into the throne room of God. We'll want to stay far because it's like, hey, God, let me just hide because there are so many things wrong with me. Yet God says, you're forgiven. You're my sons and daughters. Come into my throne room. Come meet with me. If we forget that we are not equal to God, like Job last week, we may become puffed up with pride and begin to say, God, you will answer me when I speak to you. To lose sight of the greatness and the magnificence of God. And so it's important for us to get into the word and say, God, who do you say we are? Teach us, show us, lead us. Let us allow the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, to guide us into all truth including the truth of who we are in Christ. And so God is calling us this morning. He's calling us as individuals. He's calling us as families. He's calling us as a church. And he's saying, come back to the heart of worship. Come back. Where are my worshipers that will worship me in spirit and in truth? Come, commune with me. Come, know me. Walk in the truth of who I am as God. Lay down the masks that have kept you from me. Bring the truth of who you are and just lay it before me. Believe that you are who I say you are as God. Come. And I'll invite Pastor Callisto to just come and pray for us this morning.